Let us pray. Almighty God, who through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, have overcome death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life, grant that as by your grace going before us, you put into our minds good desires, so by your continual help, we may bring them to good effect through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The New Testament reading is taken from the Acts chapter 8, verses 26 to 40. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go towards the south of the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there, now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe this, his generation? For life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptised? So he commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and a eunuch, went down to the water, and Philip baptised him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found itself at Azotus as he was passing through the region and proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be, Thanks to, God. be to God. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit because apart from me, you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. May I speak in the name of the living God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated.
We may not be familiar with vines, but many of us are gardeners. We know that many plants need to be pruned each year in order to be healthy. If we're not experts, we can in fact struggle with this because each year when we viciously cut back those plants, we can sometimes find it hard to believe that they will actually survive, never mind grow a lot better next year. It reminds me of the situation with pruning our rose beds when I was a child. My father's uncle, who lived in the same village, only visited us once a year, and that was on Good Friday, which he had decided was the day on which rose trees needed to be pruned. Considering the variation in weeks and therefore weather and temperatures this date could be, just didn't bother him at all. Good Friday was the day for pruning roses. So every Good Friday morning, there was a tap on the door and he called out without any buy or leave, I'm here to prune the roses. And he did. Many find the idea of pruning difficult. How it's described in this particular passage. Is God really going to destroy those branches that seem useless? What does this say to individuals who find Christian living and witness difficult, or who are fragile and vulnerable in their faith. So let's put this in the context of a small group of Christians struggling to survive in a hostile environment, because that's the situation in which Jesus was working. They couldn't afford to have members who were half-hearted or who denied their allegiance as soon as persecution threatened. Only those who were committed would remain. And as the early Christians saw some of their number renounce their faith in fear or turn back to previous beliefs, the image of pruning with its promise of growth would actually be one of hope. The picture of the vine and the branches is one of Jesus' most vivid and powerful illustrations of the believer's relationship with him. Just as branches can only bear fruit if they abide in the vine, the only way that believers can glorify the Father through fruitful lives is by abiding in Jesus. So the vine is Jesus, while we, believers and disciples, are the branches. The father, Jesus says, is the vine dresser or grower, the gardener who tends the branches. He prunes the fruitful branches so that they will bear more fruit and takes away the unfruitful branches, throwing them in the fire. The unfruitful branches appear to be those nominal disciples, the people who outwardly follow Jesus for a time but don't bear any fruit. The fruit we are called to bear probably includes the fruits of the Spirit that we can read about in Galatians and fruitfulness in evangelism as we bear witness to Jesus and his work. But what does it actually mean for us to abide in Jesus as branches of the vine? Well, I'm going to look at three particular things. Connection, dependence, and continuance. First of all, then, connection with Jesus. Abiding in Jesus means having a life-giving connection to him. A branch is connected to the vine, and the vine is connected to the branch. We abide in him, and he abides in us. If there's no connection... There's no life and there's no fruit. So going on to then dependence on Jesus. This aspect of abiding, unlike connection, is not reciprocal. The branch is dependent on the vine, but the vine is not dependent on the branch. The branch derives its life and power from the vine. Without the vine, the branch is useless lifeless and powerless. Sap 
flows from the vine to the branch, supplying it with water, minerals, and all the nutrients that make it grow. And so we can say that believers receive the sap of Christ's grace through our life-giving connection to him. We are completely dependent upon Jesus for everything that counts as spiritual fruit. Apart from him, we can do nothing. And then, continuance with Jesus. The word abide means to remain or to stay or to continue. It means that we go on trusting in him, that we keep on depending on him, that we never stop believing. So to abide in Jesus is to persevere in Jesus and his teaching. This is what Jesus was talking about when he says, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Remember, abide is actually a command. Jesus tells us we must abide in him and in his love. It's something we have to do. So is abiding in Jesus something that's true of all believers? It's not that some Christians abide and some don't. If you believe in Jesus, you are in him, you are united to him, you are connected to that life-giving branch. But no matter where we are on our spiritual journey, we can experience the reality of this connection to Jesus more and more. We can become more fruitful. The passage that we heard not only speaks of bearing fruit, but of bearing more fruit and much fruit. The result of all this pruning means that we can enjoy Jesus more. That's why Jesus says, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. He not only wants us to have joy, he wants us to have full joy so we can experience the sweetness and the power and the joy of our connection to him in greater degrees as we go and grow in our daily dependence on him. If abiding in Jesus involves ongoing daily dependence on him, what on earth does it look like then? Well, Jesus tells us. We abide in Jesus by letting his words abide in us and by abiding in his love. So to abide in the vine means to be united to Jesus, to rely on Jesus, and to remain in Jesus. In our first reading from Acts, we see how Philip was producing a rich harvest of spiritual fruit because he was constantly connected to Jesus. Fruitfulness is shown by the love that we have for one another. Without that love, we cannot claim to know God. Our love must mirror that love of God shown to us in Jesus. So don't be afraid of pruning. Like with plants, it's meant to improve us, not to harm us. Growing extra branches and leaves uses energy and nutrients that could be used for produ producing fruit. Pruning just removes unnecessary growth that hinders productivity, so the remaining branches will be more fruitful. The promise of pruning applies to all fruit-bearing believers who abide in the fine of Christ. No matter how fruitful we already may be, as his children, God will prune our lives abundantly to increase our spiritual fruitfulness so that we can be more like his son, Jesus. Throughout the Bible, we're asked to turn from this world and to stay on the right path, to live faithfully for God, loving him with all our heart, soul and mind. But rather than passively waiting for God to prune our lives, we can choose to partner with God in pruning our own lives. We can choose to prune the worldly cares and distractions from our lives that hinder our fruitfulness. 
I think that this will probably mean a bit more than an annual job on Good Friday. But I have a feeling that knowing that we have God's work to instruct us and his indwelling Holy Spirit to guide us, our presence here today means that we are all keen to glorify God and to abide in him. Amen.